Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing Canada's sex offender registry in a recent Supreme Court of Canada decision. Mr. Gourlay, in the last segment, we were talking about the public purpose of the sex offender registry. The, the origins of that registry are actually from a quite horrifying uh, case involving the abduction, uh, sexual assault, and murder of a 11-year-old boy named Christopher Stevenson. Uh, the registry, in fact, sometimes is called by the name Christopher's Law. So how does the existence of the registry help address this really serious law enforcement problem of sexual offenses and repeat offenders? What can you tell us about the public purpose of the registry? Well, the purpose, of course, is the very laudable one of uh, helping police solve terrible sex crimes. And that was the origin, as you correctly uh, point out, in the notorious crime in Ontario more than two decades ago. Uh, the idea is that Police should have uh, up-to-date information about where to locate uh, convicted sex offenders so that they can make inquiries of them if there's reason to believe they may have been involved in a further offense. The problem, as Lawrence point, pointed out before the break, is that there's very little evidence that this has actually done anything to help police solve crimes. I can tell you, I've been in practice for more than 13 years. I've done a lot of cases of this nature. I've never actually... Uh, seen a case where this, where the registry played any role in the police uh, having solved the crime. And that makes sense because most sexual offenses are committed by acquaintances where the, the, the victim themselves can point you to the offender. You don't need a registry. And other ones, uh, stranger offenses are often solved through DNA and other more sophisticated techniques. So it's very unclear uh, how uh, this registry actually assists police. And that's what the Supreme Court uh, relied upon to some extent in reaching this decision. Lawrence, in 2011, the law was changed to uh, be more inclusive and, and include more people. And that followed a review of the law, which found that it had been ineffective, um, as Matt pointed out. But the, the conclusion they drew was that they should include, include more people. Um, they've had found in this report that the low inclusion rate was actually undermining the effectiveness of the registry as a tool. Uh, but if we're still finding that it is ineffective, what, what could we do? How could the government achieve the goal of making sure the right people are included in the registry and having the registry be an effective tool? What, what type of change do we need here? I think that's a, a difficult policy question to answer, um, and I really the the police need to be asked what they would uh, find valuable from this tool. What you know, what information do they need that would help them solve crimes? Uh, that's a starting point, um, and making sure that uh, that solving that problem is constitutional. It's not uh, overly inclusive, right? That's the balance that the Supreme Court's trying to strike here, and that, frankly, that Parliament's trying to strike here. Parliament creates a law making it more inclusive in response to this legislation, or in, in response to a report, and then, um, you know, the courts look at that and say, you know what, this is over-inclusive because you're basically putting people on this thing for life, uh, who may uh, who may have very low risk or no risk of reoffending, and requiring them to be effectively on a form of probation for the rest of their life is uh, far too onerous and unfair. Um, and so, you know, it's really about striking the balance. And I think, you know, law enforcement needs to be consulted, um, and we need to get get to that, you know, that right spot uh, with. Uh, inclusivity, getting the right number of people on there, but not everybody that's uh, no risk or low risk to reoffend. Kabir, I want to get your take on this, because certainly this, this decision doesn't mean the sex offender registry doesn't exist anymore. It's just modifying who will be included and when they can be removed. Uh, but certainly there's a role for the registry. What, what do you see that role as? I think the registry is, of course, important, but as uh, Lawrence and uh, Matthew have both, both pointed out, the important part is not being too overbroad in the number of people that we include in that registry. I think allowing judges the discretion to determine who should be on the registry after hearing from the lawyers, hearing the arguments, and hearing any evidence that they base their decision on is probably the most sensible way to determine who should be on that list. The people who are at a high risk of offending, people who have committed offenses against children, these are things that the judges can then take into account in determining whether or not somebody should be on this list. An individual like Mr. Nilvu, for example, this is somebody who may not pass that threshold to be included if the judge had had 
the discretion to apply the <clears throat> the law as they saw fit. At the time, that discretion was removed in 2011, as Matthew said. And just in about 10 seconds, uh, Kabir, is, is he off the list now as a result of this decision? I think that's a difficult question. The Supreme Court provided one year for um, the the parliament to change the law. Right. Uh, I don't think he's off the list. What they're going to do if we, it is. We, um, we, we got to go to break. 